This has been an invigorating event. Um, I'm now going to uh, introduce uh, Sven Giegold. Um, I actually started out uh, my modern pro professional career uh, looking at oil producing countries in Africa. And uh, one day, about 15 years ago, I had an amazing meeting with somebody um, who was the former economic advisor to the tax haven of Jersey. And he told me an amazing story about tax havens. Now back then, tax havens were kind of seen as exotic sideshows to the global economy. They were like mafiosi and a few criminals and strange stuff going on, but nobody took them too seriously. Um, the story, the amazing story I heard was that tax havens were right at the heart of the whole globalization project. And they were bigger than I thought, much bigger than I thought. They had huge macroeconomic implications. Um, and that they weren't necessarily where we thought they were. Back then we thought it was about small islands in the Caribbean and so on. But I was being told that uh, the biggest tax haven in the world, arguably, is my own country, the United Kingdom, um, on certain measures, certain ways of looking at it. So um, I, in that meeting, I basically made a career pivot away from oil in Africa, and I decided to join the Tax Justice Network. So the person who was telling me this stuff was, um, setting, was, had, had, was one of the co-founders of the Tax Justice Network. And I joined, so I, I joined one of their first meetings, and there I was given a kind of informal interview with some very penetrating questions that were sort of looking at who I was and my background and my character. And the person who was giving me that interview was Sven Giegold. Um, and I've always credited Sven since then for being somebody who, so he was into the tax haven subject long, long before I was. And I've always credited him with being somebody who can see profound trends going on in our economies long before pretty much anyone else can. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome him to give a presentation and then we're gonna have a, uh, a short chat afterwards. So thanks, Sven. Yes, so um, dear friends, dear members of this uh, coalition, and uh, good to see you again, long time no see indeed. And uh, I have to say, um, perhaps uh, 20 years ago, uh, this group would have looked quite differently. So um, the clothing, the location, uh, the way how uh, we express ourselves and behave, and all this is not by chance because uh, tackling um, excessive corporate power has become back to economic mainstream. And uh, on economic power and competition, we can really proudly say uh, we have changed the intellectual mainstream. Our friends in the US, what they managed, what happened in several EU countries is um, breathtaking, I would say, and uh, economic power and concentration are back on the political menu, and also is um, competition policy. Um, our ministry, I could say, for us, that's not anything new, because um, I'm now state secretary in the ministry where competition policy was put in practice in Germany. Uh, in the good old uh, days, uh, of uh, Erhard and Müller Amark, and under the title of um, uh, order liberalism. And what is now important is, in that moment, is uh, to produce real and lasting legal and economic change. And, and for us, as Europeans, this means mainly on the EU level. So changing EU politics presupposes broad coalition in many member states in order to be successful on the European level. Building a broad uh, coalition includes difficult compromises. And as coming from Germany, as being a member of a traffic light coalition, I can tell you I know what difficult compromises mean. Uh, we need a broad and lasting coalition of all available forces in the institutions, civil society, and business alike, as well as academia. 
In Germany, our ministry led the fight for energy transition. We managed to change course after years of stalemate in Germany, and this was only possible uh, through the legitimacy gained from a large civil society movement, but then in alliance with a huge number of businesses which see business opportunities in exactly that political change. Not only the fight against climate change has the potential uh, for this alliance, but also the fight for open markets, innovation, and active competition policy, because they constitute a cornerstone of the social market economy which the European treaties foresee. Our language should adapt accordingly. We can proudly say competition policy and curtailment of concentrated economic power means to be in favor of innovation, to safeguard a future for our startups, to give them access to finance, uh, in order also to strengthen the power of SMEs and, gi uh, and give them alternatives to merging with large, already oversupplied <coughs> um, corporations. Your conference and your manifesto comes at the right moment before the EP elections to also define what concrete policy changes we want to achieve in the next mandate and under and for the next European Commission. Therefore, I welcome very much today's conference and I welcome the general direction of the rebalancing manifesto with its recommendations. The recommendations overlap a lot with the competition agenda of our German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Robert Habeck and myself, we set out in the beginning of our mandate a 10-point competition policy agenda. It has clearly helped over the last two stormy years in this traffic light coalition with crisis uh, all along the way that we had pinned down our direction on concrete measures early on. Also against the background of this experience, I would like to outline today two things. First, what I see as the broader political forces on EU competition policy, both in terms of tail and in terms of headwind for our joint agenda. Second, some concrete proposals for EU competition policy. So let me move to the first point. First, the antitrust pendulum swing away from Chicago and the narrow consumer welfare approach certainly has created the big opportunity for profound change. This is also due to your work over years, for which I would like to thank you wholeheartedly. This includes both the signatories and the supporters of today's manifesto. You are in a certain way the civil society wing of many of the demands we have been following for a long time now. But second, also due to the current geopolitical crisis and the need to protect our economic security, competitiveness has become the top priority in economic policy. It is unclear yet whether this will play out more as opportunity or challenge for competition policy. It is fair to assume that the next European Commission will, all about, will be all about competitiveness and industrial policy. We may see this in the letter report. We may see this even more in the Draghi report. Whether in or outside these reports, there will be calls for European champions. There will be calls for more state aid and new protectionism. And there will be the political background song. Domestic competition would adversely affect global competitiveness and be bad for economic security. This narrative is not only dangerous for a social market economy, but also bad economics. There is little that fosters innovation, investment, and transformation as much as effective competition. And competition helps to improve economic security and the resilience of our European economy. Firms in markets with fierce competition 
better adapt to shocks and changes in capacity. More competition leads to more diversified supply chains. This also helps to reduce choke points and structural dependency. And it will also help us to go through the green transition, which is a necessity for all of us and our children. In short, now more than ever, the European treaties were right. They call for a European common market, not for European common monopolies. Third, a very substantial level of state aid will continue to have an impact on competition. Today's manifesto rightly makes the connection between state aid and competition. It points out that we should use state aid also to create a more diverse, sustainable and balanced economy. Indeed, we have to make sure that we subsidize the green and digital transformation as such and not single champions. In addition, we grant state aid. Competition is necessary to guarantee an optimal take up of these subsidies. In general, it's obvious that there's a tension between a global race for subsidies and the European common market. For a real response to that tension, we need a more European approach, which means neither denying the need uh, for support of our industries, nor putting our common market at risk. Fourth, the systems competition, in particular with China, is heating up. Some of you may remember the fight over Siemens Alstrom. We are fortunate that the conclusion was it is not in our merger rules that, are, that is the problem. It is unfair Chinese subsidies. Therefore, we were right in being systematic and tough on the root causes of the problem, setting up the foreign subsidies regulation. Fifth, we need also to think together competition, consumer protection, and product safety. The EU rightly has high standards, but we also need to enforce them. Platforms such as Temu have to be systematically scrutinized and, if necessary, banned from selling unsafe or otherwise illegal products in Europe. And if member states do not live up to their task of enforcing our standards, the Commission should step in to force effective implementation. Effective implementation is not a side dish in the internal market. It can no longer be ignored in Commission's infringement policy. Let me now turn to my concrete proposals for EU com uh, competition policy in the years to come. I would like to focus on five proposals, on the DMA, on abuse of dominance control, on a competition instrument, on sustainability, and on merger control. We have the Digital Markets Act in the books. The big question now is, will it work? The rigorous enforcement of the DMA is essential because breaking the power of these gatekeepers is essential for fair competition. It is essential for giving our SMEs the opportunities they deserve. It is essential for a fairer distribution of opportunities and wealth. It is essential for our economies and for our democracies. We will be measured by citizens whether we implement the DMA or not. The European Commission has opened non-compliance investigations against three gatekeepers. There are two potential constraints on the Commission's tasks, resources and rules. On the resources, the German government has officially made the proposal to introduce fees on the gatekeepers to cover the costs of monitoring and enforcement. This is the realistic answer to the budget constraints to come, also with a view to the next um, MFF. And uh, therefore, uh, it is a logical response to ensure that the Commission has the financial means in order to have the, if, um, the respective means to, to counter the bunch of lawyers uh, from the large gatekeepers they have to face. A similar approach is already implemented in the DSA. And therefore, there are good reasons in order to give Commission also in this area 
the access to the needed resources. In the context of resources, let me address the more general issue of revolving doors. We have seen too many cases in the past where pub people switching from commission, agency, and also DGComp to big tech, law firms, and economic consultancies. The commission should implement the existing code of conduct for officials much more rigorously in order to protect the integrity and reputation of the institution. Any impression has to be avoided that knowledge and insider information gained in the public interest can be sold for private gain. And certainly, travel of commission staff should not be paid by private actors. Therefore, I've taken up this issue with the comp leadership. At the same time, some very critical voices on Fiona Scott Morton's candidacy for the chief economist job at DigiComp reminded me a bit of the congregation of faith. Also, in the future, our public institutions need qualified experts with deep private sector experience. And the larger our coalition grows, the more careful one should be with a too much based, uh, 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 with a language of campaigning, which is basically pushing away some of the allies we urgently need. The more successful we will be in our fight, the more experts from private sector will be tempted to work on the public side. Each person's profile and values has to be evaluated. The campaign against the nomination of Fiona Scott Morton, even often without speaking to her personally before starting campaigning, was for me clearly over the top. On the rules of the DMA and whether they are sufficient, let me be clear. We will not blind ourselves into just repeating the DMA has to be a success. There will now be enforcement of the DMA and there will be p swift political judgment on the enforcement. If the DMA enforcement does not achieve changes in behavior and markets quickly, there will be a tougher and different upgrade. This would have to include wider discretionary powers for the commission reaching up to structural separation. On generative AI, we have to prevent the rerun of the gatekeeper's playbook of advancing their ecosystem through acquisitions and exclusionary conduct. But this is not sufficient. We should prepare for an upgrade in the DMA to safely include gatekeepers' conduct in cloud computing and AI. On the control of abuses of dominance, the Commission will publish its new draft Article 102 guidelines this summer. The next commissioner will then decide on the final text. I welcome that the commission wants to make its Article 102 enforcement more workable. I agree with the manifesto uh, that the way to do this is to deploy more bright line rules. The commission has to reduce the number of cases where it has to carry out full economic effects analysis. We need a real rupture here. Only if the Commission is bold and leads the way, there will be change. The best scenario would be that DMA enforcement becomes a laboratory and model for more efficient and quicker Article 102 enforcement. More generally, Europe needs a competition instrument for the European Commission. We have introduced such an instrument last year in Germany. The Bundeskartellamt already had the powers to investigate a sector before our reform. Now, it also has the powers to stop a significant and continuing malfunctioning of competition. Possible remedies include closer monitoring of mergers, the facilitation of market access for competitors, or even as ultima ratio, the divesture of parts of an undertaking. Why such a competition instrument? Two main reasons. First, for significant structural competition problems in a sector 
we need more than the one-off and piecemeal enforcement against specific infringements in lengthy procedures. Second, conduct on the markets nowadays moves away from blunt cartels to the fringes of existing competition law. Therefore, we need to fill the gaps in our toolbox to tackle some of this behavior. We have taken inspiration from the UK CMA market investigation model. Some EU member states, such as the Netherlands and Denmark, are also considering introducing such instrument. The European Parliament has already welcomed the initiatives across several member states. It calls on the Commission to introduce a market investigation tool to avoid enforcement gaps. I'm working on broadening the camp of supporters in the Council. We suggest to focus the EU competition instruments on those sectors which have an international dimension and are of high importance for the overall EU economy. This is why, where our burning problems with the lack of effective competition lie and where the support for a tough European response is broad. European competitiveness needs not less, but stronger and more targeted competition policy. Another area where we have to move forward in the future on the EU level is sustainability. In Germany, we will soon reform competition law on sustainability agreements. We will follow into the steps of the Netherlands and again the UK, which I still miss in the EU, by the way, in particular with regard to environmental out-of-market efficiencies. What is more important, we have to already send the signal that the next EU horizontal guidelines have to be more ambitious in this regard also for the international debate. The fifth and final area for action I would like to mention today is merger control. We acknowledge that DGCOMP seems to have learned from past mistakes such as Facebook, WhatsApp. There seems to be a tougher enforcement line emerging, including the prohibition of booking e travely and the abandoned acquisition of iRobot by Amazon. We need a legally sound solution for killer acquisitions. Therefore, the next commission must look into a reform of the merger regulation and the guidelines on horizontal and non-horizontal mergers. This is also necessary in order to concentrate the resources of DGComp on the merger cases that matter and reduce red tape where it less matters less. If this proves difficult because of the unanimity requirement, Alternative routes for mer reforming merger control need to be used. So, to conclude, I would like to return to my words from the beginning on, fair on the Fair Competition Coalition. I would be happy to see as many of us possibly st stepping up from advocates of change into agents of change, where in and or around the EP whether in or around the Commission, for examples as members of the new advisory body at DGComp, consisting of representatives of civil society and consumer organizations, which the manifesto suggests. And lastly, I'm looking forward to the moment when your new coalition organize, organizes a powerful meeting together with the business community to defend an innovative, competitive Europe. This is the next step in order to win in all these struggles and not only to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 So we've got five minutes, four minutes till the next um, uh, intervention. So I am going to just ask, probably have time to ask one question. I think the question I'll ask is, in when the uh, German Competition Act reforms were announced last July, you said on Twitter that you had intensively experienced um, lobbying pressure. Uh, are you able to talk about that? the experience on a personal level, but also to talk about how as civil society 
we can counter a, a broader question, how we can counter this, how we can not only help push back against lobbying, but also get more entry for civil society, for small businesses, for trade unions, for um, others to have an influence on competition policy, both in Germany and at an EU level. So it's a very broad question, so answer whichever bit you want to. No, um, in a certain way, my speech was already uh, the answer to that question, because I would say we made a mistake when we suggested uh, the law. Um, many people felt they would fall victim of that new instrument, which we didn't have in mind. And as we are uh, respecting the Bundeskartellamt autonomy, we were not able to say specifically which sectors we actually had in mind, because we didn't want as a ministry to prejudge where we have long-lasting problems of competition. So, therefore, we could not speak about the sectors. Uh, it was all legislative talk, and we did not make clear enough that we didn't, for instance, want uh, to punish actors which have an, um, an innovation uh, um, advantage, and, uh, and therefore are in a moment of limited competition, which is normal in an innovation cycle, that for some time you generate extra profits, while until everybody has been learning uh, what, uh, what your competitive edge is. And these actors, which are of course powerful in Germany, we have lots of SMEs, world market leaders in specific technology intensive areas, they felt now these crazy greens want to, uh, want to torture us uh, with competition policy. And, and we were first uh, not realizing that, um, that we actually triggered these people uh, while those uh, who were meant were comparably silent. Because if they would have spoken up, uh, probably the wider public would have said, yes, please, more of that. Because, and that is very important when we speak about the experience we had here with the new competition tool. The new competition tool also failed, not because of the lobbying of the big gatekeepers, but because some actors turned against whom we need as partners in the alliance. And therefore, it's so important to focus such a new instrument on international uh, uh, on markets where we have international monopolies. And that if we do this, we have a good chance to win it in the next mandate. If we trigger, as we did, again, the wrong people in business, we will lose that again. So therefore, my recommendation in the speech was to, to be more targeted where we want uh, such an instrument in order to have a chance to win. And uh, I read with care your manifesto. My suggestion would be a bit more uh, targeted wording would be helpful to get more support. Okay, thanks. Well, that takes us neatly to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Sven. Um, it's been an honor to have you here. And I'm now going to hand over to Barry, I believe, to finish this up.